Hello. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Thank you. Have you ever walked out of a movie and wondered why you like the opening title sequence better than the film itself? This is the bomb. The 60s were filled with anxiety and filled, filled with seeds of revolution in a way. You have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. Everybody was frightened of a nuclear war between Russia and America. You duck. And then you cover. Everybody was living in a state of paranoid fear. There are two kinds of attack, with warning and without any warning. It was difficult times. So my agent got a call from Stanley Kubrick, who was working on a film about the end of the world, some sort of a comedy. He saw my reel, and he wanted me to do his trailer even though I have never done the trailer before. <laughs> this is Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, he hired me before I got there. I mean, he says, I want that person, I want that person to do this job, but let me talk to him and see what he wants. He knew about me, he knew about my work, he did his research, and I didn't know anything about him. <laughs> He always took us with him. We traveled a lot. He was just absolutely the best fun. It was very exciting. He was just a, he was just very, very cool. <laughs> really a real pro, and yet he was real daddy. And this is Pablo Ferro's contribution widely considered the first trailer of contemporary times. Attack! Russia. Oh. Oh. Ten females to each male. Every now and then, somebody would come along with something fresh and different. Hitchcock did his own trailer. And in this house, the most dire, horrible events took place. And they were distinctive. And they were very much taking advantage of his public persona. A split second off timing and... Cecil B. DeMille did the same thing, and he had a large public persona. No, it's not make-believe. And, of course, Orson Welles made a classic and famous trailer for his first film, Citizen Kane. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Orson Welles. But those were the exceptions to the rule. When Dr. Strangelove's trailer came along, no one had ever seen anything like it. It was sending a very loud signal to the audience, this movie's different. We're showing you a commercial for it that's utterly contemporary and completely different. Perfect match. We saw a lot of tickets. Um, a theater in Texas made an ad out of it, say, so come and see the wildest trailers ever made. Perhaps if they went to see experimental films at the Museum of Modern Art or at Avant Garde Film Festival, maybe they would have seen something that approached that technique. Where's the bathroom? Dr. Strangelove. But even there, they might not have seen what he pulled off in that trailer. Love the bomb. A moving picture. When I finished the trailer, Stanley asked me to stay on a little longer to set up the movie with an opening title sequence. The ultimate weapon, a doomsday device. We were having a conversation, and then he asked what I thought about human beings. And I said, everything that humans invent is always very sexual. All the machinery, it's always like that. 
We looked at each other and said, B-52 refueling in midair, of course. So that's when I got the idea to do the tall lettering. Together it worked. You were able to see the lettering and the plane at the same time. It set the tone for the film so that people weren't afraid. Is it a black comedy? Are we allowed to laugh? Which is a big thing. That's right in the front of Strangelove. Seeing those two airplanes and saying, I think this is funny. They were so crude and so childlike, yet so sophisticated. Dr. Strangelove was immediately celebrated by critics, by a lot of members of the audience, by many social commentators, and as we learned years later, even by some members of the American government. It was a brilliant and remains a brilliant black comedy. And Kubrick, a master filmmaker at his very best, at the height of his power. And Pablo, he was Kubrick's guy this creative, odd fellow that we'd never seen anything like him. We were working with Hal, and a phone call came into uh, Hal's house. It was, it, it was a call from my father, and it was Stanley, and he was saying uh, he wanted him to come and look at this film. And my father's very honest about what his situation is, and, and he always has been, you know, I'm working with Hal, and I, I've got this schedule and everything. And he said, well, don't worry about it. We'll just, you know, you could get on the Concord. Get on the Concord. It's a great ride. And I think my father was used to being accosted by Stanley at the time. I mean, he, Stanley would just kidnap the whole family and utilize Pablo's uh, and his work and his ideas until he was done and then say, now you could go home now. <laughs> and it wasn't in, in, in a malicious way. I mean, he would do that, he would take care of us. I mean, he flew us all over there, and put us up in a, in, in, in a nice place, put, you know, I, I went to school there, it was all on Stanley's dime. But I think that maybe my father, he may have voiced a little bit of resistance at the time. Who is it? Sorry, but we don't usually let strangers in the middle. He uh, uh, showed me the picture, and I went home, went to the hotel, and I locked all the doors. So I was very paranoid, <laughs> so I fell. And I uh, heard the uh, William Tell Overture. I said, ah. That's interesting. One frame is in and one frame is out. Looks like it's an effect like almost three-dimensional. A Clockwork Orange was one of those movies that had people talking. It was the buzz of the moment. And so for months, you'd have people saying, have you seen A Clockwork Orange? I mean, some people were appalled. Some people were reviled. Some people were bowled over. It, it had a whole range of opinions, but everybody had an opinion. It was one of those films. This is Pablo Ferro. Pablo Ferro. Pablo Ferro. This is Pablo Ferro. Pablo Ferro. Pablo Ferro. 